My name is Judy Fentress Williams, and I'm delighted to be your instructor in the Biblical Institute, which is a part of the Center for African Biblical Studies here at Trinity United Church of Christ. Those of us who believe that the Bible is sacred text would say without a shadow of a doubt that the Bible is a theological a text, that when we read the Bible, we are undertaking a theological endeavor. It is less often the case that we think about reading the Bible or studying scripture as an imaginative exercise. And I want us to begin our study today with the understanding that the work we do with scripture is both theological and imaginative. Now, when I was in first grade, my first grade teacher, Miss App, used to say on occasion to us, now I want everyone to put their thinking caps on. And at that moment, we would all stop and we would, in this imaginary way, place something on our heads. Now, I don't know what anybody else's um, thinking cap looked like, but mine was a bonnet because I always tied it underneath my chin. Now, it's interesting that Miss App asked us to do that because if you're in school and you're in the classroom, you should be thinking all the time. So when she said, put your thinking cap on, she was inviting you to pay attention, to focus your energy, because the fact of the matter is, if you're in school all day, every now and then your mind is gonna wander. So for those of you who are accustomed to studying the Bible, who know that this is God's word speaking to us, that this is a way for us to understand more about what it means to be the people of God, I want you to be intentional today and put on your imaginative lens because the text that we are reading today is an imaginative text. It comes to us with different languages and a variety of cultures, different worldviews, different theologies, and different genres. The writers, the storytellers, used their imaginations to tell us the stories of God and themselves. And if we're going to engage that, we need to use our theological, our sanctified imaginations. Think of it this way. When the psalmist says, God is a rock, that is an invitation for you to use your imagination. The imagery and symbolism is asking you to think about God in a way that is not always literal, but powerful and real. Theological truths require our imagination. Now, some people would tell you that there are at least two kinds of imagination. There is synthetic imagination and creative imagination. And synthetic imagination is when you take everything that you know, the things that you've been exposed to, the things that you've seen and heard, the things you know from your own experience and combine them in new ways to make something that has a new meaning. Creative imagination is purportedly something that is unique and new. But if we understand imagination correctly, I would say that creative imagination is not distinct from synthetic imagination. There's nothing new under the sun. And just because you discovered something that's new doesn't mean that it's the first time it's been discovered. So I wanna invite you today to think about the music you listen to. Now there are young people out there who are listening to music and think that it's all new, when in fact what they're listening to is a remix of James Brown. Whatever it is that we discover in scripture, whatever we bring, I wanna invite you to bring that into this remix, into this space to reimagine and rethink. We need our imagination. We need our imagination whenever we engage this complex collection that we call the Bible, but we particularly need our imagination with difficult texts. So I wanna invite you to bring your imagination to the story that we are about to read in the Bible. Now, whenever we're reading the Bible, we need our imaginations because this is a complex and complicated collection of stories and materials. But we particularly need our imagination when we come to the difficult stories, the hard texts, the ones we wish weren't in the Bible or the ones we read around. So I invite you to come with me to Genesis chapter 34. And I should let you know this may be a difficult story for some of you. Um, this is a story about 
an assault of a woman. And so I want you to know that um, before we go further. Genesis chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the region. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl to be my wife. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dina, but his sons were with his cattle in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, just as the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard of it, the men were indignant and very angry because he had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The heart of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Make marriage with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall live with us and the land shall be open to you. Live and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor with you and whatever you say to me, I will give. Put the marriage present and gifts as high as you like, and I will give whatever you ask me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dina. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, that you will become as we are, and every male among you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take our daughters for ourselves, and we will live among you and become one people. But if you will not listen and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone." Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his family. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, these people are friendly with us. Let them live in the land we trade in it. For the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will they agree to live among us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their animals be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will live among us. And all who went out of the city gate heeded Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day, when they were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the cities unawares and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and made their prey. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should our sister be treated like a whore? That's Genesis chapter 34. That's a hard story. And some of your Bibles probably have as a heading, 
the rape of Dina or Dinah. And I want us first and foremost to ask this question, what happened to Dina? So let's make a few observations. There's a lot in this text, but I wanna point out a few things. The story starts with Dina going out. She goes out from the home co compound and out from under the protection of her family. But there's nothing in the text that condemns this. And there's nothing that suggests that it is irregular for women to go out. We should be mindful that there are some interpreters who use this element of the story to promote the sequestering of women. This idea that women will be safe if we keep them close to home. But I wanna be clear that that's not what the text is clearly saying. So let's look at the language at the beginning of the story. The story tells us that Dinah went out to visit or to see the women of the region. And while she went out to see, she was seen or acted upon by someone else. We get a series of verbs. The Bible says Shechem saw her, took her, lay with her, and humiliated or humbled her. Let's look at the series of verbs one at a time. The first one's fair, fairly straightforward. Men in the Bible often see women and often they see and take women. Um, so we see a series often that will say a man saw a woman, took a woman, and then lay with her. A predictable series, saw, took, lay with. That first verb, to take, lacha, means to take hold of. We see in stories that talk about inappropriate sexual encounters, like um, Amnon and Tamar. In that story, Amnon takes the same verb, lacha, Tamar. We also see it in Deuteronomy 22:25, where it talks about the taking of an engaged woman in a field where no one hears her cry out. But we also see the verb in very acceptable sexual unions. In um, Ruth chapter four, Boaz took Laka Ruth and went into her. We see in Genesis 38, Judah takes um, a wife. He took, he saw her, he took her and went into her. This is an acceptable series. So what I want us to be clear about is that men taking women in the biblical world is not necessarily the offense. Now we'll revisit that, but I want us to be clear that taking and seeing and going into a woman is not the point that makes this story difficult. It's the last verb. And I would suggest it has something to do with how it happens and who is doing the taking. The language that is used to describe sexual activity between a man and a woman carries with it cultural values. That there are acceptable ways of taking and unacceptable ways of taking. In the story of Dina and Shechem, the word we wanna pay attention to is the last word. Um, Ina, he humiliated her. That last word gets translated in some places as he took her or slept with her by force. But the only way you can get that interpretation is if you decide that the last verb is modifying the third verb. So that you'd read, he saw, he took, he lay with her forcefully. But another way to read it is, he saw her, he took her, he lay with her, and in so doing, humiliated her. One interpretation then has to do with the way in which he took her, and another has to do with who he was and whether or not he was an appropriate person to do the taking. Stay with me here, because essentially this will help us decide what happens to Dinah. There are biblical interpreters like Tammy Schneider who argue that Dina or Dinah was definitely raped because of the way she reads that last verb. And there are other scholars like Tamara Cohn Eskenazi and Andrea Weiss who argue that biblical rape laws were primarily concerned with whom you were taken by. Whether or not the father would approve. 
Shechem offers to marry Dina. That would have provided her with full status as a wife in the household. The issue here then could be the status of Jacob's daughter and the maintenance of Jacob's line. So when we try to translate these words, we have to confront the challenges of the language and the cultures that produce them. How does the language carry the assumptions or convictions of a people? Or another way of asking this question is, how does one translate a word for rape when there is not a word in the culture for rape? How do we describe rape when we are talking about a world where a woman has no legal authority to give or hold consent? If we describe rape as sexual contact against someone's will, how do we adjudicate that against the fact that we are in a culture where a woman doesn't get a vote? Except for the rare exception we see with Rebecca, that unsanctioned sex or intercourse of any kind is at the discretion of the father. What I want us to understand then is when we talk about the ancient Near Eastern world, or we talk about ancient Near Eastern culture, we are talking about rape culture. The Bible lays out the process by which a man can make things right after he sleeps with a virgin in Exodus 22:16 and Deuteronomy 22:28 to 29. So if we want to talk about what happens to Dina, we have to first talk about the cultural context um, and talk about that cultural context and how it ties in to Israelite identity. So the Israelites were people called by God, and we have these ancestral narratives about the construction of a communal identity. Woven through these stories um, about God and about worship and about kinship, we have this idea that all of these people come from a common ancestor. Um, they come from, that. I'm sorry, Abraham comes from um, Adam and Eve, so we have Adam and Eve, and then we have this dissemination of people, and then we get Abraham, and God selects Abraham to make a new people. Then the whole Abraham narrative cycle is about how Abraham and his descendants are different from everybody else. How are the Israelites different from the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites? And these stories are consistently showing us how this separation takes place that the chosen people can't marry outside their kinship group. Shechem is an outsider. And is there language for sex between an Israelite and an outsider? In the recent history of our own country, the language used to describe sexual relations between Africans or descendants of Africans and those under the construct of white carries the weight of our cultural bias. Any time, until very recently, I hope, any time a black man had sex with a white woman, there was the possibility that that could be construed as rape. White women who secretly engaged in mutual sexual relations with black men had the power to claim they were raped if they were caught. And what vocabulary did we have for black women who were assaulted by white men? particularly their masters. Dina's humiliation is connected to Jacob. And when then is a story like this more than a story? When is a narrative an invitation for us to look through the characters and look at the system? Stay with me here. If we look at the narrative system in the story of Jacob, what we want to ask ourselves is, what is the narrator interested in? What does the story tell us and what doesn't it tell us? How does it tell us the story and who gets to speak? Let's start with the characters. The characters are Dina, who has no speaking part, her father Jacob, her brothers, 
all of them, but particularly Simon and Levi, Simeon and Levi, Shechem the prince, and his father Hamor. So when we look at all of these characters, one question we want to ask is where are the other women? Dina goes out and gets involved with Shechem. And the nature of that involvement is treacherous, no matter how we define it. She is either held in Shechem's, Shechem's house or she is there willingly. We don't know. But what we do know is that Dina belongs to a family unit that consists of more than her father and her brothers. Dina has four mothers. Where are they? What did they know? What did they want for Dina? The way the story is laid out, Dina appears in the first four verses and she's acted upon. Verses 5 through 24 are about this negotiation between these two groups of men. In 26, she is taken out of Shechem's house so that Dina goes out at the beginning of the narrative and then is removed again at the other part of the narrative. And we have no idea of where she is in the midst of this. We only know where she is located physically. Dina goes out and gets herself in an international incident. She is taken. She's negotiated over, a deal is made, the deal goes bad, and in the end, a nation is destroyed and plundered, and Dina disappears from the narrative. In chapter 35, we go back to the story of Jacob. And that's when it dawns on us that even though your Bible might say the rape of Dina, that perhaps it should read the violation of Jacob's honor. Or perhaps it should read the rape of the Shechemite women. Or perhaps it should read the rape of the land of Shechem. Because what happens to Dina in the first four verses of this text, in some way, shape, or form, happens to all of the land of Shechem. These men go in and destroy and loot. Perhaps in this story, there are then two women, Dina and the women of Shechem. And perhaps this is a story that shows us that this is what happens in a world where men have control over women's bodies. Perhaps this is a story that shows us that this is why Women should always have agency. This must be a moment for us to entertain the possibility that from the perspective of Jacob, we should never think that the story is just about us. So long as this is a story about Jacob's honor and Jacob's standing and what it means for Jacob, people like Dina will not be able to have their full humanity. We're going to stop there for this section and then we'll come back to part two where we will revisit this story again.